Hola mi gente and welcome to the Color Hybrids Podcast Season 2, Episode 10 with Denise Diaz, based in London, Colombiana. Hey Denise, thank you for being here with us today. Thank you, Gabby, for inviting me. I think this is an amazing opportunity. What a great initiative to bring all Latinos professionals together. So, well done. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this as well because you are a marketing expert with over 11 years of experience. We're going to break it down for people today with how to do your digital marketing. But before we get into all that, let's learn a little bit more about your backstory. How did you end up in London and what part of Colombia are you from? I am from Barranquilla, Colombia. So every time that I say Barranquilla, Shakira. Yes. <laughs> Shakira's land. Uh, I'm from Barranquilla, Colombia, and I have been in the United Kingdom now for 13 years. So quite a long time, but prior to that, I lived and I worked in Turkey for a year. So mm -hmm. I have been out of my country 14 years now. It's been an amazing experience and it's given me a lot of opportunities. So what made me come to London? Wow, that's uh, an interesting one. Uh, <laughs> Because I was in Turkey and the idea was always to come to Europe to start my MBA. So I had Paris and I had London. So I had a backup. I'm an engineer, so I always like, what if, what if, what if? I have backup plans. So in the end, I had a boyfriend in Turkey and he came to London to live. So I was like, no, 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 no. I have to remain focused. Career first. I'm going to have and um, see Paris and London and see which one of the two I get along with better or I fit the most. So I said, okay, first Paris and second London. I went to Paris and it was quite a shock. I just feel like I didn't belong. I felt a little bit weird when I went there and I was just like, oh, oh dear, this doesn't look that good. But you know, I learned French. So it still could be a possibility. Then I came to London and I fit it straight away. I felt it. You know that feeling when you just feel it in your gut that this is my city. So I came here and I absolutely loved it. And I was like, I'm staying in London. That's it. I started my career in London. I started my MBA here. I study. I progressed my career. Fast forward 13 years later, I'm still here and I'm still in love with London. So it's my adopted city, let's say. <laughs> Oh, wow. That's cool. I have never felt this connection with any other city and I have traveled a lot. I love Turkey when I went there and I studied, but I knew it was not going to be forever. When I came to London, I said, this is it. I fit here. I feel welcomed. This is my adopted city. So yeah, there you go. <laughs> that's for a story. That's really cool. All right. Before in our conversation, before the interview, which I was like, yeah, good for you. Is there's a lot of pressure for immigrants if they marry someone with an English sounding name to change yeah. their name. Yeah, yeah. And who chose not to? Why is that? For me, it's always been a personal choice. I am for what makes you happy. You come to this world to be the best version of yourself. So I just didn't feel like it. I just don't think for me, my heritage, my traditions are very important. It's made me what I am today. So I feel that I don't want to change my name. I was born Denise Diaz. I have a partner in my life, my husband, that feels equally the same as me. So if it doesn't bother me, it doesn't bother him. We're in a relationship. Why would I try to please someone else? No. So that's in a, in a, in a nutshell why I haven't decided to change my name. And I want to be buried Denise Diaz. All right. I didn't change mine either, but it was by accident. <laughs> <laughs> really? what, what happened? Tell me your story. Why, why didn't you change it? Well, I had been planning to change it. And then we got married in Denmark. They don't automatically change the name. So then we got home and we looked at the paper like, oh, they didn't change your name, honey. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but it, it, that's what I say. This is a very personal decision, right? This is very personal to me. But I don't judge people who want to do it. Everyone is free to do whatever they want as long as they don't harm someone else. So I think that changing the last name is very personal to you. For me, my last name means my heritage, my traditions, my childhood, my costumes. So 
that's what I kept it because I wanted to be part of me forever. I don't know, maybe I'm just romantic. <laughs> no, no, I can see that too. Even in my husband's culture, he's from East Africa. Okay. When people get married by default, they don't change their name because they don't have a middle name or last name, like most people call it. Their name is their name, their father's name, and their grandfather's name. That's their name. Mm. So they don't change their name when they get married. Mm. It helps well, them to track their past, I guess. Their past, exactly, exactly. That's a good one, actually. It's mm -hmm. very informative, yeah. So yeah, I guess it's the same thing. Like you have DS, I have Van Horn that can help us track our well, own roots. And I think you touched a very good point there as well, because that's something that I always have said to my husband as well. If we ever feel we want to have some kids, it's a good way for them to understand where mommy and daddy comes from, where does this last name come from? It gives them some sort of history and purpose as well. That's my belief. <laughs> That's true. I agree with that point. <laughs> we want to ask you, Denise, just like a lot of the people we've had on the show, you have your day job and then you also have your side hustle. So what's the difference between the two right now? My professional job, it's been something that I have worked since I came to London. It has been taken time to develop. I'm currently the marketing director for an award-winning business school, and I manage three brands. Actually, now I manage two, but I previously managed three, and I have managed maybe 13 different brands for the organization. So it's my full-time job has been the result of 11 years of hard work. My side hustle is to try to help more people apart from the ones that I'm helping now. So it's a little bit about expanding reaching maybe someone else that might need my help. So that's why I started this in 2017. But obviously it's very difficult. It comes with challenges because I have a very high pressure job. So I have to be always on top of things, managing different teams. The beginning of the year was I was managing a team in Singapore. I have a team in India, I have a team in here. It comes with the title, the responsibility. My side hustle is just trying to get to new audiences and see what can I do of value with my free time. How can I invest that free time to maybe perhaps help other people that needs it? That's why my niche is small businesses, because I know that I don't have the time, don't have the team, don't have the capacity to source or to help big companies. So it's interesting. It's a very interesting approach. And I think it's challenging for people to find the time to actually do your full-time job, do your side hustle, and also have a life. And also have <laughs> some time left for your partner, your husband, if you have kids for your kids. So yeah, it takes quite a good work-life balance thing. Yeah, it's true. Sometimes the work-life balance is like work, and the other side is life. It has to go yeah. up and down <laughs> sometimes. Yes, but that's life. It depends on your priorities. What do you consider your priorities as a human being? What's your priority? Is your priority emotional wealth, financial wealth, what is it? You prioritized based on, on that, but it's difficult. It's difficult because not everything in life is constant. Mm -hmm. everything, good keeps, everything keeps moving. That's yeah. why I like marketing as well, because nothing is constant in life. So you re reorganize your priorities based on, on circumstances, situations. Yeah. That's true. Wealth doesn't mean the same thing to everybody, but let's see if we can get some of your expertise here. You've been sharing a lot of different tips on LinkedIn and also Instagram. But the first thing, a lot of companies, they completely were caught by surprise by COVID-19. So a lot of people had to go online. Hopefully you're still not stuck with what's step one in October since we've been in this for 10 months. But if you are, <laughs> then you can find out some stuff here from Denise. So if you're starting with your digital marketing strategy, where should you start? It's easy to get overwhelmed. Oh yeah. The internet is amazing. Google is like your best friend, but it can be overwhelming because then you have so many sources and you don't know which ones to believe. And I think this is a very good question, Gabby, because small businesses, especially tend to start everywhere and nowhere. <laughs> So I can see them like, I'm going to build a profile here and I'm going to build a profile in Instagram and I'm going to build a profile in Facebook and I'm going to do this and I'm going to marketing is about understanding the basics first. Take a step back. Let's go back to the basics. First thing you need to do as a small business, 
and any business is understanding your audience. Who is your customer? Who is your ideal customer? Who are you talking to? That's the first thing. Everyone wants to get started immediately, but no, 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 no. You have to do the groundwork first. So get all your thoughts, all the thoughts that you have in your head about what your company wants to be and put them on paper. Let's start building what you need to formulate a strategy and to formulate your tactics. So first and foremost, know your audience. Who is your customer? Who do you want your ideal customer to be or your client to be? The second thing is understanding your value proposition. What are you giving them that is valuable? Uh, what is the problem that you are trying to solve? Who you are helping, how you are helping them. That's key. So understanding your value proposition, understanding your product, why is it good? The third one that it's a little bit underrated and that people sometimes don't do is competitor research. How do you stand against the market? What are your competitors? What are they offering? Why is your product different from there? And why do you want to make it different? Why they should choose you over them? So that's the third one. And the fourth one, which I think is also something that small businesses don't do that often is establishing your branding. Branding is, is important. This is what it's going to make the customers recognize you immediately. Building that trust or evoking those feelings that you want a brand to evoke. So be consistent with your branding. Sometimes I see people posting one thing, the colors are different. They don't communicate the brand story. Branding is more than just, I'm going to pick a logo and I'm going to pick some colors. And, Yay, <laughs> that's it. No, 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 no. Wait a second. It's more than that. What are your company values? What is your mission? What is your vision? What are the kind of sentiments and emotions that you want your branding to evoke when people see it? And that's it. So to sum up, know your audience, understand your value proposition, understand your competitors and why your customer should choose you over them and establishing your brand. Yeah, it's true. Sometimes that means, well, all the time that should mean not marketing to everyone. So I know I get a few people that are upset with me. It's like, why isn't this podcast in Spanish or Portuguese? Or why don't you make any more posts in Spanish, Portuguese, or the other languages that you speak? I'm writing in English on purpose. Because, as you said, Denise, my target audience is people who already speak English at a certain level and want to get past that level. Precisely. So that's why, people. <laughs> and to, exactly. Precisely. That's a very good point. You can't please everyone. You cannot please everyone. You have to be very niche with who your customer is and how your product relates to solving those customer needs. Sometimes, unfortunately, that's going to mean not making some people happy. But at the same time, business evolves, as I say, marketing evolves constantly. So it's a lot of trial and error too. You might start with something that you think this is a great product, a great service. And five years down the line, you grow, you have the possibility for a, for a bigger team. And then you decided, okay, let's expand. Let's try another product. Then that product could be, okay, people who definitely don't know any English at all, but they want to get there. How do I service them? And how can I do that? Then maybe five years down the line, you can see that that's probably another product that you can offer. But at this point in time, it's all about the priorities and our budgets as well, or and time. Putting your energy in the activities that you know are going to be useful to your business. Yeah, especially if you're a solopreneur, you only have so much time in the day. You only have so much time. And that's another thing that I said. Do not waste time on things that are not going to add value to you or to I don't know, add value to your KPI. What is your KPI? Your KPI is growth. Your KPI is sales, revenue, decreasing costs, or building connections. If it's building connections, then you don't care about the money. But let's be honest. Let's be honest. The majority of the businesses, unless you're a charity, it's to generate some sort of income to, to, to get return on investment. Yeah, even if you are a charity, you need money to keep doing what you're doing. Exactly. <laughs> You, you need donations, right? <laughs> That's true. But how can you market without being salesy, still educating, but not being like, hey, buy this. How can you yes. do that? Yes. <laughs> and, and there has been a transition with marketing because marketing and sales have always been very interconnected. From my perspective, I always say for a business, three departments that are super important, marketing, sales, finance, anything else could be later when the business grows. Marketing has evolved to be more about building connections 
and building trust because building trust drives revenue. So it's about telling stories and that's why storytelling is super important. That's how you can educate your audience without being salesy. Tell your story, tell your brand story, tell your product story, use testimonials, tell people about the behind the scenes. You have to create that trust connections through content and good content that's going to keep them entertained, educate them, entertain them, motivate them, and then sell them. So it has to be a mix and match because unfortunately, Gabby, if you don't sell, but not in the world of being salesy, if you never sell, then what are you in business? Yeah. Right? No sales means you close down. So sales doesn't necessarily have to have a negative connotation, but it's about building connections. It's sharing the narrative. I don't want only your money. I want you to be with me forever. And, and that should be the case. You want customers to stay with you forever. You want returning customers. And I, it, obviously this depends on the business as well. Not all businesses out there offer products that you can come back one time, two times, three times or four times. But if you do, if you offer that, then that should be your objective. You want to keep them coming to you. Yeah, that's true. You got to make connections like the panaderia, but you have to make the big moves like Microsoft. <laughs> exactly. That's a very good, that's a very good example, Gabby. That's great. Yeah. I'm yeah. learning. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I agree. But now with so many things being online, people are moving more towards email marketing and cold calling. So how can you make that a little bit warmer to not to build the relationship faster, but make it a little bit less Hi, How are you? Be like, Hey, this is something that might help you. It's keeping that story consistent across all touch points. I mean, who likes cold calling nowadays? I don't, I don't like when people call me and say, I just find out that you had an accident. <laughs> no, this is a challenge is getting the context that is going to speak your, to your audience, getting the right message there. Email marketing is a very good tool, not to only get customers at your doorstep, but also nurturing them. It's an amazing tool for keeping them with you, but it's very challenging because your email can get buried amongst all the other emails that you receive. I personally receive maybe 50 emails per day. So you have to make that email be seen. You have to have an amazing subject line. Once they open the email, they have to read the content. They have to click on it. After they click on it, they go to the website or landing page, whichever you are using, and they have to convert. So there are so many steps in one email. You have to make it amazing. That's the challenge. Because if you open them and you don't click, that's it. Mm -hmm. If you open, you click and you go to the landing page, and that message is not consistent, they are out. So it's about how you can keep that message consistent across different touch points. But if you do it well, you can keep them with you. Then they take the active approach of inquiring. Then you know that you can call them because you know that they are interested and they are more likely to reply rather if you just don't call them out of a sudden. So you have to provide that value. It takes time, but hey, nothing in this life is easy. <laughs> this is another thing that the small businesses do that is probably a mistake. They want to get new customers. I want new, I want new, I want new. <laughs> the desperation to have new that they sometimes forget the customer they already have. So as well as finding new customers, get to know the ones that you've got because your customer is your best product. If you make one customer, one client happy, that person is going to talk about you to someone else. Word of mouth is so powerful as well. Mm -hmm. you know? People love recommendations. If you build trust with one, then you get two, three, five, ten times more. So get the right balance and don't focus on new, 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 and forget the ones that you have. That would be uh, my suggestion. Yeah, that's a good point. We had a guest, I think it was last week. He said something similar with the translators that he works with. Sometimes they want a hundred clients, but he's like, no, you just need five really good ones. And then some other people that come every once in a while. Precisely. Exactly. I completely agree with that. And again, word of mouth is super powerful. It's building connections, referrals, testimonials. You can leverage on those. 
That's true. Pavel, you're a genius. You need to talk to Denise also. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up a little bit here because yeah. Denise was so nice to talk to us during her lunch hour, but we have to give her some time to eat as well. <laughs> no, that would be, thank you so much. This is an amazing opportunity. I wish 13 years ago when I came to this country, I had this support network. And I think what you have done is amazing because the Latin community, especially, we lack that. You know, your aspiration, your objective to get the Latin community to get to the, the next level and showing them through these episodes what you can achieve. It's amazing. It's a really good opportunity. So honestly, well, well, well done. This is a great initiative. I can fully support it, which is what I was so happy to be part of this. If I would have had the same support network when I came to London 13 years ago, I probably would have figured out things faster. Time is the best currency in the world. Unfortunately, you don't, you don't get your time back. So you have to make sure that you spend your time very well. And that's, that's one of the things that I wish I could have done better when I was younger. But anyway, you, you learn from all your mistakes. <laughs> and that's the reason I'm here, so that people can avoid what happened to me when I came here. <laughs> well, thank you for the compliment. Yeah, I'm really grateful that I uh, was able to find people who were willing to share their stories, like you said, to save that time for people. Even on the website, when we have the transcripts of the conversations, we call each of our guests Latino mentors, because that's what they're doing. They're mentoring our listeners to help them avoid certain mistakes. Be like, no, you don't want to do that. Just go this way. <laughs> so like you said, it saves a lot of time. Exactly. I 100% agree with you. And, and I hope that we can continue to work together in the, in the future. I'm pretty sure this is not the last time we are going to see each other. I hope this was uh, helpful somehow getting some marketing tips. I'm always very happy to help people. I think it gives me a little bit of purpose my, to my life. I've always liked to help when I can. So hopefully I have help someone in some way by being here today. Well, you don't have to hope. I know you did, but <laughs> how can people get in touch with you and get more of your wisdom if they want to? Okay. Yes. So you can contact me on LinkedIn. I'm very active on LinkedIn too. Denise Diaz. Instagram. My Instagram handle is ddiaz online. So you can see it from here. And I'm going to be launching my website, which is really exciting. Uh, awesome. So it's www.denisediaz.online. So you can get to know me a little bit more there and what I have done in the past. So it would be great to be connected. Yeah. And everybody, that's Denise with two S's because she yes. is unique. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. That's a good one. How was your name? Denise, double S. And Diaz, Diaz. No, Diaz. Diaz? <laughs> Diaz like Cameron Diaz? Oh, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so Cameron, Cameron has made my life easier, I have to say, when I get to this country. <laughs> ay, yeah, yeah, yeah. People and their spelling problems. Yeah, yeah. But everybody, you need to go check out that website. And before then, go ahead and connect with Denise on Instagram. She shares tips for small businesses there, along with step-by-step -step tutorials of how you can make your posts better. So I've le been learning a lot from those. I hope they help you as well. well thank you, Gabby. Thank you so much. Hopefully, I will continue with these tips as well. So yeah, keep your eyes peeled. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be great. And for those of you who are like, Yes, Denise is awesome, and I want to be a clever hybrid like her. Go ahead and check out not only the transcript of this episode, but how we might be able to help you on cleverhybrids.com. So until next time, learn by doing and asking. Hasta pronto. Bye.